Identity is one of the more important topics that we're looking at today in the field of e-learning and indeed the internet generally. It's something that's really been catching people's imaginations. It's pretty important. We're looking at things like, you know, digital identity on the threshold of a revolution. We're looking at the economic impact of digital identity in Canada. And of course, Canada's digital economy relies on a foundation of digital identity. So we're talking about identity in e-learning today, e-learning 3.0 specifically, but we need to keep in mind that, you know, there's this deeper background that's going to come into play. So what is identity? It's one of the deepest issues in philosophy. Uh, and, you know, it's one that runs through the history of education in a single thread. It might seem like an esoteric issue, but, you know, it's, a, it's the sort of issue that touches home very quickly. What kind of person am I? Is it up to me to decide? Do I have to be a certain way? Am I inevitably locked into the person that I am now or that society says I am? Each of these touches education in some way. From... Matters as mundane as ver verifying identity and an examination hall to trying to figure out what kind of citizen we want to graduate and what kind of person we want them to be. How does what and who a person is impact how we teach them and what we teach them and what we expect them to be? And we need to ask, you know, uh, and Jenny McNess said this in a comment, whether we should be thinking of identity from the outside in or the inside out. Can we teach identity? Is identity something that can be done to us or for us? Or is identity something that's inherent in our nature? Something that we bring to education as course participants? Something that informs how we see and how we learn? Equally important is the role of identity in education. Is it the lens through which we study and, and research education? Or is identity the carrier uh, of, digi of degrees, certificates, permissions, etc.? Now, there's no single way to define identity. And the history of philosophy, if it's taught us nothing else, has taught us that. It could be based on substance, it could be based on essence, which is some inherent defining element of ourselves could be according to function, right? So we are what we do. Maybe it's continuity. Uh, maybe, you know, I mean, there's the story about the ship, right? Uh, one of the old wooden ships and it served in the Navy for a hundred years. And, you know, as one part wears out, they replace it with a new part. And after a hundred years, someone figured out that every single part in the ship had been replaced. Is it the same ship? Or do we have to give it a different name? Or maybe identity is purpose and value. Maybe identity is what we aspire to, what we believe in. Maybe identity is membership. Like Ottawa Red Blacks, team, support, part of the community. So in this course, we created a challenge. And the challenge was create an identity graph. And so here's the challenge sitting here on, on the course webpage. Read it quickly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but we got a bunch of really interesting responses. And so I, I want to look at a few of those. So here's one from Matthias Melcher. His, uh, as he says, first attempt. And uh, here's the updated version. So let's look at the updated version. So... It's very large. So you see he's, he's collected a bunch of different interests and in education, knowledge, management. I like how they're nicely sorted into different color categories. Some question marks, etc. I'm going to steal his thing and make it work on my version of Grasshopper because, you know, it's so cool. So that's one, right? Uh, here's Roland's identity graph. Uh, which, there we 
go. And so here we have, you know, journalism, art, sea and water, significant others, some different categories, right? Uh, all based on a core philosophy of Buddhism and humanism. So that's interesting. It's interesting how, you know, normally we would put self right there, but he's put Buddhism and humanism. Um, identity graphs. Um, I'm not sure if she's got one on this post, but let's take a quick look. Quick look, because I don't want this video to be too long. Here we go. Uh, cycling, Flickr, Lancaster, India, Strava, which is a cycling app, etc. Um, so let's look at dog tracks. So dog tracks has you. He's used a scatter graph. So, you know, writing days through the week. So that's a pretty inter in interesting interpretation of it. And of course, the obligatory cartoon about identity. It's a little hard to read, but there it is for posterity. And we've got, uh, what else have we got? Jeff Kane, Brainstorm and Progress. And that's my cat letting himself into the room, if you're wondering what the noise is. A writer, educator, teacher, administrator, student, etc. Any more? Sure, we got more. Um, so this is um, I'm not, I've forgotten how to pronounce that. I used to know. Uh, I know. I know. Olga. Blog. Hey, yeah, let's come, come. Yeah, <laughs> super educational video with a cat meowing in the background. Architect, freelancer, writer, author, speaker, blogger, etc. And you see now he wants out because <laughs> he's a cat. <laughs> um, Frank's identity graph. I'm going to take a quick look at this here. So this is his website, right? Feedly, eLearning 3, about LTSC, thoughts, reclaim hosting, Juno designs, etc. Simnet blog CCK08, 10 years ago now. How about that? And so this is a Wordle and data, etc. So, okay, and if I've missed you, I'm sorry, you should have been in here and I don't know why you're not and I'm gonna have to check it. Um, but that's a sampling, this is live video creation. So, it's an interesting challenge, wasn't it? And a lot of people wondered why one of the stipulations was to not add a node, not add uh, a node assigned to the self or to me. And I, I think that was an interesting uh, addition. Of course, I say that I did that myself, but you know, well, you know, um, I'm just trying to get my background nice, but okay. So we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, we're trying to get with this concept of the identity graph away from the idea that my identity is of different parts of me, you know, as though you could divide me up, you know, and I'm part English and part Irish, you know, or that I spend part of my day cycling and part of my day watching Netflix, or that I'm partly trained as a philosopher and partly trained as an educator. What's important here? is how these parts interact to form a complex whole. And what, what I noticed with a lot of these graphs is that the line actually signified and is part of relationship. But really, and, and you can, I mean, technically you can, and your, your graph becomes a conceptual graph. But maybe the line connecting the different nodes of your identity should be talking about or representing, I should say more accurately, how 
one thing impacts, interacts, and influences the other. Now, much of the technological discussion of identity looks at it pretty narrowly, and, and, and that's no exception here. Um, it asks how we can know who someone is, how we project ourselves on the internet, how we can be safe and secure in our identity, prevent identity theft, things like that. Um, but in a wider sense, with a lot of these uh, technological innovations, we're developing a mechanism for the creation of a digital identity. Now, a digital identity isn't the same as my identity, and I know that. All right. A digital identity can be seen as a representation of an identity, although I, I wouldn't exactly say it's a representation either, right? Uh, if I publish something online on my blog, say, which becomes part of my digital identity, that's not really representing myself. It's more of an outcome or a product of myself. So it's not simply a relationship of representation to the real thing, as it were. And the other thing, too, is with a digital identity and the other identity, which might be, say, my neural network, or it might be, say, myself as embedded in a physical community. Again, many ways of defining this, right? Um, these interact back and forth. Um, who I am as a person influences how I define digital identity, how I create that digital identity. But then how we define our digital identity in turn comes back and shapes ourselves. It's like that famous quote attributed, uh, so I read incorrectly, to Marshall McLuhan, right? We shape the machine and then the machine shapes us. We shape our tools and then our tools shape us. So even so, our relation between technology into each other is also in a state of flux. That's what this whole e-learning 3.0 series is about. Um, back in the day, which is the phrase of the moment, uh, you know, in the era of websites and content management systems, when we had a client server model, we were the clients. E-learning 1.0, right? In the era of platform-based social networks like Facebook and Twitter and the rest, as has been famously said, we were the product. Anything that you get for free, you are not the client, you are the product being marketed, okay? But now, what happens in a world of artificial intelligence, linked data, cryptographic functions, and more importantly, what happens when this digital network is something that we create rather than some digital platform company? Are we ultimately the content of such a system? And that's, that's a question to be pondered. Uh, some of the reaction during the week was negative to that idea. But if we're not the content, then how do we stand in relation to these digital identities? Now, in, in addition to creating the identity graph in this course, uh, I ask people to consider some additional questions, and, and you'll, you'll see how these all come into play. First of all, what was the basis for the links in your graph? Are they conceptual, physical, causal, etc.? And I touched on that just a few moments ago. Another question is, is your graph unique to you? What would make it unique? Is, you know, and there's a couple ways of looking at this. Is the graph itself like a fingerprint? or that's a train going by in the background, uh, you know, something that's uniquely you, organized uniquely you. If your graph was exactly the same as someone else's graph, would that mean you're digital twins uh, or digitally the same? What about, um, you know, can there be fingerprints in the nodes themselves? I'm gonna talk in a bit about hashes and, and, uh, and public keys. Maybe that's what makes it unique. Another question is, how could your graph be physically instantiated? Like I said, a lot of people represented these as these lines as part of relations, right? You know, this is part of my activity, that is part of my activity. 
um, how does that physically instantiate not just out there in the world where you actually spend some time cycling and spend some time photographing um, but also in the digital graph how how does that represent it? and you know uh, in Jenny's there was the link to Strava right and I wonder if I wouldn't have just put the link to Strava as part of the digital identity um, and then you know out there in the world somewhere there are actual cycling activities which are the causal basis for the Strava data and that speaks to the fourth question what is the source of truth for your graph that's a two-part question the first part is you know how do we get the information that actually goes into the graph uh, you know uh, I'm looking at you know um, drowning selecting organizing maybe that should be drawing yeah I think that says drawing uh, petabytes etc so where is the information for drawing there where is that coming from secondly um, if you know you know if we're looking at this graph from a third party perspective how do we know it's true how do we know it's an accurate representation or an accurate uh, production of the self and these are more than conceptual questions these are core questions that are underlying a lot of the work that's happening in the development of identity today so for example one of the key changes in web 3.0 technology is the way we identify ourselves right now and right now it's managed very badly uh, really really badly um, you know we have on one hand just anonymous access which you know has its values and I'm not going to deny that but uh, you know having the whole internet be anonymous really isn't workable anonymous has its place but not as the core foundation of our participation in an online community um, password based authentication by itself while well, we know how vulnerable it is to hacking and even worse how vulnerable it is to us forgetting the password or having a gazillion passwords which is what I have uh, as the one report says online identity today is siloed fragmented unreliable insecure and hard to use so we need to fix that and we're going to fix that in two major ways um, one is we're going to be getting true multi-factor uh, true multi-factor um, oh I thought I could just click and it would open but that's silly it won't just click and open in the other there we go true multi-factor authentication um, so for example the UB key um, and as as Laura Ritchie made clear in one of her comments uh, multi-factor authentication isn't you know one password and then another password um, what it really means is that uh, multi uh, multi-factor authentication is actually using multiple types of authentication so if we look here right could be something we know something we have and something we are and using two of these three so for example it could be uh, a password and a fingerprint or even better it could be one of those UB keys and a fingerprint and now you know if we've gotten out of the realm of forgetting entirely and we like that so that's one thing the other thing and I did another video on these so I'm not going to go into them in depth uh, dig digital signatures and cryptography and the idea here is that you have a public key and a private key and the way to think of it as I said in the other video your private key is like a key but your public key is like a lock 
and you distribute the public keys like giving out locks to people people can use those locks lock a message and send it to you so that only you can open the message now we haven't verified that they are the person actually sending the message if you want to verify that you are the person sending the message then you have to sign the message with your private key and then you send it to someone and then they can use your public key to verify that yes in fact it was sent by you so two factor or you know public key infrastructure um, uh, you know public and private keys is the other aspects now typically historically uh, public and private key or you know a public key infrastructure methodology has been based on centralized systems but what's happening is if we combine the idea of identity graphs and we combine the idea of two-factor authentication and public key infrastructure what we get are something like distributed identity networks and so there have been you know a number of developments in this area already uh, so you know the promise of identity uh, managing identity on the blockchain uh, these distributed identity networks um, or if we have a look here at this site for example a first look at identity management schemes on the blockchain and the blockchain is an area in which uh, we can have a distributed network and something like public key authentication. So uh, maybe digital identity can be trusted identity and yet also distributed identity so it's, it's not um, owned or controlled by any uh, individual single centralized organization and so we're, we're seeing things along those lines um, you know we're, we're seeing for example uh, the next version of the web of trust and and the next version of the web of trust is something like the web of trust based on the blockchain um, so you know, let's take a look at the specifications and the reports etc or it might look like our um, if you will our digital wallets uh, our digital wallets are places where we can put our bitcoins and there's a whole bunch of them available already but they're also um, you know they can they can be digital or we can also have physical digital wallets a lot like the UV key um, which use the the public and private key authentication and in which we can keep our digital coins and we can store our personal information on the blockchain or some such things here's the point though uh, cryptographic keys either digital or physical will become the norm and this will give us a per permanent identity if we want that not only secures our data but it is our data um, we can represent ourselves with names identifiers public keys and whatnot but from any perspective what we have here is some facet of a mesh a complex mesh of interconnected entities a complex graph really that is matched only by our neural network itself and these digital identities will be more or less depending right uh, connected to our physical identities because we ourselves are the basis for the links in the graphs we are the source of truth if you will for our digital identity um, and whether they reflect our economic activities our social connections the things we make the expressions of our communities and aspirations of values they are ultimately a reflection of us so we were the client, we were the product, are we at last the content? Well, in an important sense, we're the thread that runs through what would otherwise be this disconnected set of data, right? It might be our, our public key that is this thread, it might be something else, 
that is this thread but ultimately we're the thing that brings all of these things together that creates these links knowledge about ourselves our associations our community they will create an underlying fabric against which the value and the relevance of everything else will be measured and this is really important right um you know instead of demographics uh, it's being about quantity sales charts votes and elections or hits or followers or things like that it'll be about quality we'll have and and even more it'll be about the rich tapestry of data and relations that we have uh, you know it's not going to just be facts because facts will always end up reducing to this um, you know identity based on quality identity based on essence which is kind of sterile kind of unchanging uh, the the quantified self will give way to the qualified self the qualified self will ultimately give way to the connective self facts aren't sufficient uh, facts are descriptions of properties uh, and and so we could only define for example our membership in communities by our properties and so you know that's sameness uh, of the sameness of that defining identity in terms of sameness leads to definitions based on things like uh, religious purity ethnic purity nationalism and we know we know that that's moving in a backward direction uh, that's moving in a direction that breaks communities apart rather than brings them together and these kinds of self-definition are ultimately essentialist ultimately limiting and ultimately static just not able to change so we come to the connected self but what does the connected self look like what does connective identity look like well we're beginning to get a sense of it right and we're beginning to get a sense of it um, from the way people are already identifying themselves online if we look at how people are defining themselves online they're defying convention they're using things like selfies and um, lol cats and animated gifts etc and but what they're doing more is you see as, as the article says here um, giving visuality a place of primacy people are snapping selfies as sedimentary identity texts and curating life streams as opera operationalizing community so these are communities based not on what you are but on the basis of some kind of interaction with everybody else in the community similarly what about uh, community based on uh, interacting with celebrity personas uh, so you know we get that you know and, and people like uh, uh, well these people um, but uh, I'm, I'm looking for it here but I'm not seeing it uh, Henry Jenkins etc looking at community as fandom uh, looking at community as association around this this shared concept you know being a trekkie being a red blacks fan being a blue jays fan etc so and and these are not just you know people saying yeah i am a red blacks fan but through their activities posting tweeting uh showing pictures of yourself wearing the gear etc so now connective identity the loose concept here doesn't eliminate number doesn't eliminate fact these are still aspects of ourselves but it doesn't allow them as Laura Ritchie says either primarily or independently to be defining conceptually it allows that there are sets of statements containing facts and data and these statements uh, are connected and I use the word statements really loosely a statement might be a digital entity here it might be a graphic it might be a lolcat a picture whatever and they're linked to each other they are connected such that a change in one statement can result in a change in another statement a change in the meaning of one statement can result in the change of another statement 
And physically, it amounts to the idea that we actually are this interconnected set of entities. Our physical identity is our, our neural network, of course. Uh, or maybe it's our neural network, our embodied network, um, and the embeddedness of that embodied network in the social environment. There are different ways you can cash this out, and I'm not going to try to resolve that right here, because that's a whole other talk. Um, and this self, this identity, literally is this set of connections. And what's important here is when we speak of an identity, what we're actually speaking of is a snapshot of some aspect, some facet of this connected mesh as viewed from some particular perspective. You know, you, you can't grasp the whole uh, because there is no way to grasp the whole. You, you look at it from outside, from a perspective, and then you recognize, oh, that is so-and-so. Uh, you know, you recognize that person in that facet. It's, uh, you know, uh, your identity exists either by means of your own perception of yourself, kind of like looking in a digital mirror, if you will, or by means of others' perception of yourself and recognition of yourself as a something, whatever that is. So how does this feed into e-learning 3.0? Well, it's not easy and it's not straightforward, is it? Uh, I, you know, and I'd like to give you, you know, a nice clean answer here, but I can't give you a nice clean answer because it's really going to depend a lot on how we as educators manage and adapt to and work with these distributed identities. Um, and it's going to depend on how we as individuals manage and adapt to and work with these digital identities. So far, we haven't done it very well. So far, we've retreated back to identifying ourselves according to tribes, uh, according to sameness and things like that, rather than the richness and diversity, diversity of the connections that we have. You know, we do have this unparalleled opportunity, though, with digital technology, with digital community uh, and digital identity to become more self-reflective, both as individuals and as a community. Our new identities, and they are new identities, we didn't have them in the past, are, have the potential to be an enormous source of strength. They can, you know, building from community, building from diversity, even, even the way I constructed this talk, this paper, drawing on the contributions and, you know, in, in, in the final outcome of all of this, I'm going to be very clear about who the contributors were because they've been very important to this. Um, you know, drawing on all of that, the interaction, the discussion, to come up with this concept that is more than any of us had to put into it in the beginning. Or it might be a debilitating weakness, right? We might find ourselves lost in this sea of possibilities, uncertain of who we are because we're not able to navigate this complex web of connections and interactions. Uh, so what will we do? How will we define ourselves if, if we don't have this capacity? How will we forge new connections, create a new community of interwoven communities online and in our homes? We might not be able to do it. We, we might just reject the idea of living in a diverse interactive community and try to retreat into sameness. I think that would be a mistake. So that's identity. Uh, you know, um, I wanted to keep this shorter, but oh well. Uh, there is no easy answer here. Some of the topics in the rest of this course are going to touch on identity and they'll help answer some of these questions. But ultimately, we still have some open issues here. Uh, we have some open issues in how we define ourselves in relation to the digital world, how we define ourselves in relation to each other, how we define ourselves in relation to ourselves. Are we forever who we are? Or is identity, as came up in a conversation about a week ago, uh, ultimately about potential, about possibility, 
about hope, aspirations, and dreams. I like that picture of identity. And, and, and maybe, maybe that's the one I'll work with going forward into the future. I'm Stephen Downs. Um, if you're wondering about the, the snazzy video effect, this is XSplit's new XSplit camera. Uh, so I'm not using a green screen. I'm doing this digitally. How about that? Uh, it has a little issue with my hair. I, I could have fixed that by putting on a hat or moving the hair back, but I decided, no, you guys can live through it. Thanks a lot. This is eLearning 3.0 course. The date is November 18, 2018. I'm about to go watch a football game. Um, and uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching.